This is Rob Gray from ASU and PerceptionAction.com. Today on the Perception in Action podcast, my interview with Dave Collins, professor and director of the Institute of Coaching and Performance, University of Central Lancashire in the UK. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, my interview with Dave Collins from the University of Central Lancashire in the UK. Dave received his PhD in psychology from the University of Surrey. He has had several positions, including academic appointments at Manchester Metropolitan and the University of Edinburgh. He has served as performance director for UK Athletics, He is currently the director of Grey Matters Performance Limited, his applied consulting company. He is also serving as director of the Rugby Coaches Association, and of course, his current position as professor of coaching performance at UCLan. He is a prolific researcher, while at the same time having also worked directly with several Olympic and world champion level athletes. Therefore, I think he brings a really unique combination of research and application. And we do discuss how he achieves a balance between these two. As we also discuss, he is highly active on Twitter, at DaveGM4P, and a must-follow in my opinion. Other topics we touch on include, what do sports psychologists actually do when they attend events with an athlete? What is involved in talent development, and what role do early traumas in one's life play? What role should performance analytics and performance monitoring play in sport? Hope you enjoy! Not ten years ago, I was a child I was a good boy and you let me go Now I'm on a talk show, talk show So today my guest is Dave Collins, professor and director of the Institute of Coaching and Performance at the University of Central Lancashire in the UK. Thanks for taking some time to talk with me, Dave. Absolute pleasure. To begin, I'd like to start with the question I always start with. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in sports science and performance science? Very young boy, I wanted to be in the military. Got in there, scratched that itch, moved from there into teaching children, moved from that into educating teachers, moved from that into performance. Common threads. One, performance. There's performance all the way through there. Two, working with people. Convincing people to run at people when they're shooting at you is a bit of psychology. (laughs) Convincing children that actually what they want to do is what you'd like them to do is psychology. (laughs) Convincing guys that they can go in and teach others is also psychology, and that's what I do now. So the thread, Rob, has been performance, the promotion, the understanding, frankly, helping people do better than I could myself. Right, right. A lot of what you learn from sport applies to these other... A lot of different domains in teaching. I think the more I do, the more I see, because most of the people I work with are human, Mm -hmm. and and that's the common denominator. And so, you know, whether they're performing in this domain, clearly there is a a psychosocial element so that I might work with full contact karate slightly differently to ballet. But (laughs) apart from that, there's, there's there's a lot going on that's the same. Yeah. And when you started, did you have kind of a goal for more research side or more working directly with athletes? Because you've done a lot of both, right? Yeah, for sure. The research was always fascinating because, you know, I'm, I'm the little boy in the sweet shop who asks why. And I want to know, how's that work? How's that work? And, and, and I also want my, I want my work to be evidence-based. I, I want to be able to, as much as I can, explain to a client so why are we doing this? And I want them to ask me, and I want them to understand why we might be doing stuff. So I was I was very into the finding out, which is what really drove me to a PhD in psychophysiology, in electroencephalography specifically, because I wanted to get much more a much harder feel on what was going on. That doesn't mean that I, you know I don't rate and do a lot of qualitative work, but I wanted to be able to come up with definite answers. And for me, but for me, that research has always been, I, I love the idea of this pragmatic research philosophy. Is this good research? Well, does it make a difference? Mm-hmm. And if it makes a difference, then, you know, to, to a great extent, I'm going, that's what we're after. So I'm fortunate enough to work with some 
brilliant, much cleverer than me, and like-minded people, all of whom have been performers, all of whom work with performers. And, and that's what we do. We drive the answers to the questions that need to be asked, mm-hmm. as opposed to what I feel lots of research is, which is answering questions that don't need to be asked. Yeah, or, or can be asked, I think. Uh, yeah. And I think that's there yeah. as well, just because yeah. you can measure it doesn't mean it's yeah. important. Or you, or you have the equipment to <laughs> set up to do that's this right. yeah. little variation. Right. One, yeah. of, one of our colleagues talks about machines that go ping. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I don't necessarily think you need a machine that goes ping or, or a, a scale for it to be important, on the contrary. Yeah, and so I mentioned you've you've done a lot of applied work working with elite athletes, and you've been like the director of UK athletics. And one of the things I like to try to do is give people, you know, that don't know what a, a feel of what it's like to be a practicing sports psychologist. So, can you talk a little bit about some of the work you've done? And I know you like, for example, you've gone to the Olympics with athletes, and you've gone to the World Championships. What's it, what do you do when you go with them, and what that what's that like? As a, it's a great question. I, I think the greatest analogy for me, the, the thing that I bring most to performance at a games is having been a combat soldier. Because, <laughs> because that's, you're having to think very quickly under pressure. And although no one gets killed, it's, you know, the consequences are pretty big. Mm-hmm. That said, if you're good, you've done lots of stuff beforehand and it's almost like you're a, a large aid memoir. You're just a large, hey, this is good practice, guys, let's do. And even to the extent that they'll just look over you and go, is this all right? And we'll go, yeah, you're okay, <laughs> you're on track. I, I, yeah, I've, as you say, Rob, I've worked with lots of teams, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean, nor should it mean, that I get buy-in and involvement with every athlete there. But I, I, I remember one athlete who I didn't particularly work with saying to one of the coaches, I'm never sure what Dave does, but everything goes better when he's there. <laughs> I thought, I'll take that. Yeah, people don't notice you're there. It's probably a good comment. I'll tell you what, yeah. my, my, as my size, yeah. as you can see, they don't notice I'm there. They probably yeah. need they need more perception action coupling. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that later. <laughs> yeah. So I mentioned you you do work with a lot of sport governing bodies. Do you still do that? I noticed you're, you're kind of on a new, is it a committee for rugby? I'm a director of the... Uh, the Rugby Coaches Association, right. because, mm-hmm. I mean, clearly, our football, not yours. Yes. The round game, yeah, right. Yeah. I, mean, I played your game, and I love it, but I'm not <laughs> animal good at football. But, you know, football managers, the average, I think, life expectancy for a premiership manager is 14 months. Mm-hmm. And rugby is starting to get that way as well. And also, of course, to be able to support guys with professional development to, to keep them at the cutting edge. So I, I do that. I work with several, you know, governing bodies, several large sports organizations. I'm at Chelsea Academy today. I do stuff in rugby academies, you know, a, a, a wide variety of sports. And that's a real pleasure because, again, you see you see the transfers, the crossovers, as much as the differences. And that's when I think you start going, oh, that, that, you know, it's again, if you're, in, if you're a pragmatic sports scientist, you want to be in there making a difference. Yeah, and it must give you a lot of ideas for what, needs to be done in the research side oh, of things. Man, I have so many bloody papers I haven't written yet. <laughs> and as I speak to you, I have eight chapters on a book that I've got to finish by the end of March. So, <laughs> But as I've always said to people, if you make a list of the things you've got to do, you feel so much better because you're organized, you can go down a pub. So, Yeah, I think everybody, when you first start, you have a feeling as a grad student, probably you'll never think of an idea for an experiment, but you get to a point where you have an infinite number of them. Yeah, oh, so mate, I've never had a problem in the mouth. Yeah. It's finished. Then. Yeah. That's, um, in actual, it's not finishing the things. It's writing them up. Yeah. It's not, and, but seriously speaking, if I know the answer to that, I know the answer to that. And I, then I'm looking at the next problem, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, I think that's, that's where we are, you know? When you work on the practical side, and I don't know if you feel this too, you're very, very productive, but... I'm starting to get a bit exhausted with the publication process oh. for some things, and I just I lose. I just can't be bothered sometimes. Bob, it, I'm right. With, I'm right yeah, with you, mate. Yeah, and it, it's not even the publication process. I think it's the peer review process. Yeah. If I get many more reviews that say you haven't written enough about my work, <laughs> you haven't written the paper that I'd like to have written 
I, and I think it's it's very easy to point the finger and criticise. And I think what people need to do is to say, well, look, I I might not agree with this, but by gosh, it's worth putting out there. Yeah. Because it's an interesting idea. And yeah. and for me, academic is being an academic should be like being a rugby player. You know, you can have this big fight, but then you can go and have a beer after. So right. that's fun. you have this discussion, this to and fro, mm -hmm. and it's it shouldn't. You know, it's it's not personal. It's just I'm not sure I agree with that. So let's have a go. And see what happens. Yeah, definitely. If you, if you don't like it and don't agree, publish a response. <laughs> don't try to yeah, suppress yeah, and, my yeah, stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so many journals won't take response papers. And that really ticks me off. Yeah. Because you're going, but that's the whole point. That's the academic bit in the academic argument. It's not how many references you get in or how many long words you use. It's the to and the fro. Mm hmm Okay, let, let's dig into some of the research you've done, uh, maybe starting with the common thread you mentioned of talent development. What has your research shown about the role of psychological factors in talent development and kind of the framework you use to understand it? I think the shorthand would be they're not the only thing, mm -hmm. of course, but they're pretty damn important. So I've been working this morning with some immensely what I call gifted 14 and 15-year-old footballers. They're, I mean, clearly, that you know, a, a club with this the resources this sort of size, they're going to find lots and lots of good people. But I call them gifted. Now, a subset of those, Rob, have the work ethic and the attitude and this, that, and the other, which will enable them to go to the top. They're talented. Mm -hmm. Okay. Makes sense? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've had, I mean, for example, in whilst I've worked at this academy, we've had some gifted footballers one of them is now a world top eight 200 meter runner. Mm -hmm. One of them is now in the England rugby squad. Interestingly, he thinks he, you know, he left here because he felt he was too small. So Lord knows what he's doing in here. <laughs> <laughs> but, but again, the, the, those were kids with talent. Mm -hmm. They had a work ethic. They had the attitudes. They had the, the skills that we've codified as the psychological characteristics of developing excellence which is a mouthful, so we just go PCDEs, mm -hmm. that, that, that help them get to the top. And so what? So I feel my job is to be here and is to help graft on and develop the PCDEs to some, to some indecently gifted young men and in other academies, young women. Right. So do you, is gifted mostly physical? physical traits um, it, it can be it can be physical it can it can certainly be psychomotor mm -hmm. yeah and coordination the fact, the fact that you're ambipedextrous the fact that you have superb perception the fact that oh sorry don't be careful guys superb vision mm -hmm. the fact that you know you, yeah those sorts of things come in but you know uh but when you start getting down to it and the reason I'm a psychologist, I was an undergrad and we did a, did a class and, and I said, uh, physiology class, and I said, how do you know it's a max test? And the physiology lecturer looked at me like I was a twit and said, well, they stop. And I was just out the military. And I knew that under certain circumstances, you didn't stop. <laughs> and so one of my favorite stories is the, the study that uh, looked at the, the VO2 max of American football players and then got them 5% fitter by changing the sex of the tester. Right. So, you, you know, for, for me, the psychology is playing a big part. I wouldn't be arrogant enough to say the whole part, but it's pretty big. And, of course, Rob, we can do something about it as well. So as the psychologist here or the psychologist elsewhere, I'm helping people to acquire skills that will enable them to be better. Mm -hmm. And how difficult it is to take those kids that are gifted but don't have work ethic and dedication? And that must be a real challenge. It, it can be. And, and to be honest, if, if you were to say that the capacity to be talented is normally distributed. So you've got some kids at one end who are, and by the way, kids is gender free. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, <laughs> yeah. just to get that in. Yeah. Um, you've got some kids at one end who are just their work ethic, their intelligence, their, their sense of how they want to be is just massive. And you just go, buddy, go on. And I'll just help you. I'll just support you. And away we go. You'll fly. And you'll fly if you decide to do football or athletics or rugby or dance or music or whatever. At the other end, you've got some guys who might be indecently gifted, but they're, you know, the technical term would be they're idle beggars. And you've probably got them too late. 
you probably picked up, you know, you probably formed a relationship or tried to form a relationship with them too late in their development. So I have seen some, you know, we're about to uh, put a paper out that looks at coulda, shoulda, didn't. And the main reasons why people didn't, the big far and away reason for experienced coaches with 10 or more years in academies at the top line is why Why do I see a kid at 10 who is, there is no way that child is not going to make it, but he or she didn't. It's in between the years why they didn't. Yeah. So if you then go back, you've got a, you've then got the big mass in the middle of the bell curve and you're saying, actually, we can do something with these guys. And wherever they are, we can identify and improve their skills. It's improve the skills, improve their confidence that they've got those skills and improve their ability to apply those skills. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, that's great. That's a positive benefit to them. Even if they gave, give up the sport, that's a positive benefit to them. Yeah, the confidence one is the big one I've seen too with some of these people. That insane level of confidence some people have is is amazing. I think that yeah, you've got to, yeah. I think that it's it's something that some people really stress, mm -hmm. over stress, and it's some things that people don't stress enough. It's three legs of a stool: the skills, the confidence in those skills, and the ability to apply them correctly. And yeah. that might be domain specific. So I might have a great growth mindset in football, but a rubbish growth mindset in, in, in my schoolwork. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And yeah. So what you're saying is actually you've got some skills over here, boy. You know, bring them over here and they'll be equally useful. Right. But you just need to see that you've got them and get the confidence that you've got them. And I need to work, you know, to practice you on how to use them. And then all of a sudden, Hunky dory. Yeah. No, I think that's really interesting. Yeah. What I, another thing I wanted to ask you about is a bit more specific. It's this issue that we're kind of seeing now. It's in various forms. You know, you have the reversal of the relative age effect. And I know this idea that having kind of a trauma or really ah. things being really difficult for you when you're young actually turns out to help you later on, which it's the same time interesting, but also I think kind of dangerous finding in the wrong hands. So what what I, kind of research have you found, and you know, what, where do you think we should be taking this? Well, I, I mean, we we might have to take the rap for the rap line "Why talent needs trauma," mm -hmm. um, which seemed to us to be catchy, but which, as you say, has a potential upside but a big, big potential downside as well. So, hands up, Mia culpa. Or we are cult, but we shouldn't have done it, uh, maybe. But I think what you recognize is that our work was saying that kids need challenge and they need to overcome challenges, but sometimes they need to fail at challenges. Mm -hmm. Because if they always succeed, then they're not challenged. So what you're doing is you're putting children, my children, you're, anybody's, you know, you're putting children, not necessarily in sporting context, but in a general context, you let them, you have given them the challenges and let them try. Yeah. You take the trainer wheels off the bike, you run along beside them, holding them by the shirt, but you have to let go. And then they have to try and ride and they might fall over and they might cry, but they get back on the bike and they try again. And that, and that's what they do, you know. And if they do that, that's great because so long as you're careful how you do that, and so long as you're careful to make sure that they have learned the lessons of that success or failure, then next time they come and they'll be better. But that little that little caveat, that and so long as you've made sure you've learned the lessons from it, is the important bit. Because of course early trauma can wreck you for life. You know, so you know, your parents divorcing, your brother or sister dying, having a bad in injury or accident, all these traumas can be growth, but they aren't necessarily automatically growth. And that's my concern. And that would probably be where my group would disagree with what I'll call the resilience experience group mm -hmm. that says, well, all these people had this experience. Therefore, that, you know, a traumatic experience. And that traumatic experience was the key thing. And I'm going, no, successfully negotiating that that traumatic experience and using those skills elsewhere. That was the thing. Because for every one kid you meet who's had a traumatic experience when they were young and grew from it, 
you'll probably meet eight or nine kids who had a traumatic experience when they were young and is suffering from it today. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's a great that point. Sense. Yeah, well, definitely, because yeah, yeah, the all these kind of studies were definitely taking a very biased sample, right? When we're, we're looking at the relative age effect, we're looking at people that did make it through, you're right. There's a lot that completely fell out. But I think you're right. You're right. The interp- how you learn from it and how you get up afterwards is, is really and, the, and that's the See, that again, Rob, is the role. That's the role for the coach. Mm-hmm. That's the role for the psychologist. Hell, that's the role for the parent. That if you can go, look, this just happened and that's a beggar. And it, and even if in years to come, you'll look back on that and go, well, that wasn't very important. It's pretty traumatic at the time. But you got through it. So when we did we did our Super Champs Champs and Almost paper, and we're, we're deliberately matching up, we're matching triads of people who had loads of international caps or loads of medals with people who maybe got one or two with people who never got there. And, and that was the interesting thing, to be able to take three footballers of the same nationality, same age, same experience, and match them up and say, well, what are the differences between these three? And... There were a number, but one of the big differences was the extent to which the super champs had experienced challenge and been helped to overcome them some of the time or failed and come back and had another go some of the time. Mm -hmm. At the other end, the almosts had, I think, what you guys use the term snowplow parents. Lovely term. (laughs) Short difficulties out the way. Yeah. And again, we see that a lot here. You know, we've got parents who are so committed and keen to see Junior playing premiership football that they just, they're phoning on the phone all the time. Then, you know, they, the kid doesn't have to do anything for themselves. Yeah. We have a common, we have, we have snowplow and then we have helicopter parents too. <laughs> just kind of finishing off then on the talent uh, development, I wanted to ask you kind of another hot topic is the specialization diversification question yep. and what what kind of things are, what are your thoughts on that what have you found related to that diversification almost all of the time mm-hmm. i don't particularly see i only see maybe one sport in the world that is an early specialization sport and that's women's gymnastics yeah mm-hmm. and but but anything else and I, I mean i have good friends who are tennis coaches all in dance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, I, I think if you've got the if you've got the right basics, then your ability to turn your hand to something else later, yeah, mm-hmm. is I think you can do it. I think you might not be able to do it in certain environments because the door's been shut in your face. So, you know, my experience of certain tennis pathways has been that if you aren't hitting full court by ten you aren't going to get into the program that will give you the accelerated experiences which will take you all the way through. That's a socio-political issue. Mm -hmm. It's not a psychomotor issue. It doesn't mean that if if tennis walked into Chelsea today and said, cool, you've got some talented 18-year-olds here, do you mind if we take them down the road and teach them tennis? They wouldn't make a good fist of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that I mean that's that's my experience. I you know I, I can completely understand that there is some evidence that some people have made it from starting at the age of three, mm-hmm. and there is also some evidence that some people have made it starting at the age of twenty three. Yeah, yeah, and okay. you know, on aver- but on average, diversification is better. And I, I think there's some excellent work done by Arnie Gulick on this. I think that's it's really good, you know, it's good stuff, and it makes a it makes a lot of sense. It makes pragmatic sense, theoretical sense, and it tells you what to try and go and do, which means for me it's good research. Yeah, I think you're 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 right, and you could pick out examples on either side. That's sometimes we, you know, the Williams sisters. Uh, Another topic I know you've done quite a bit of research on that I'm really interested in. I think is is kind of you mentioned the machine that goes ping, the the performance analysis, the monitoring technology, and one of the things I, I you know I think you've done some interesting stuff on is looking at how athletes are going to accept this and get them engaged in this. And I wanted to get your thoughts on kind of that that area. I mean, look, being able to give people measurements or numbers or values is immensely useful. And and clearly, well, we work in an expectancy-laden field, yeah? And 
if we don't cash in on that expectancy, then we're, you know, we're twits. You should, of course, get in there and, and try and exploit that. But just because the machine will measure it doesn't necessarily mean it's valuable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I'm very into psychophysiology. I really like psychophysiology. I also recognize that two of my favorite websites are Neuroscams. And uh, I'll use an English term here, Neurobollocks. For those of your Western Hemisphere uh, readers, look it up. In the, in the <laughs> but it's it's suggesting, it's almost like you put neuro on the front of something, and it's like putting low fat on the front of a food. Everybody goes, ah, must be good. Mm-hmm. So, therefore, the use of any form of, of analytical or measurement tool is, to me, it's part of the picture, and it can be a quite important part of the picture, but you sure as heck need to be critical and triangulate to make the most of it. Mm-hmm. So as an example, you've got a software developer who's developing a tool for doing analysis. Yeah, I won't name one because they'll probably sue me, but you you know, and all of a sudden they go, hey, look, it'll do it'll do reverse slow motion. And everybody goes, hey, great, it'll do reverse slow motion. And they never le- they never think to go and talk to someone who's in motor control. Hey, is that good? <laughs> is, that, is that a silly idea? But it does that. Yeah, great, but it's a silly idea. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's it's sometimes we're more driven by what the machine that goes ping will do mm-hmm. than what we should be using the machine that goes ping to do. Yes. I guess the, the last research topic I wanted to mention on is a really one that I'm really interested in and you've done some great stuff on is the issue of technique change or technique modification. And I know you have some... You have a good model of that, and you've done some case studies of that. And so can you talk a little bit about that and why that's so difficult for an athlete to do and, and how to kind yeah, of facilitate sure. that? Sure. I think the idea of skill acquisition has been well done. Uh, I, I had the pleasure to meet last year Bob Christina, who is still looks still looks fit and, and active and is still doing great work. And he's recovered from having me in his motor control classes at Penn State. But it, it was all, it always struck me that this was an eminently practical thing. This was something that all coaches should know about. Yeah. But the, the, therefore, what we needed to do was to come up with answers. Here we go again to questions that needed to be asked, not that could be answered. So therefore, when I looked at skill acquisition, I'm going, I think there's some really good stuff here. And we use it as the basis for our work with coaches through another, sorry, another acronym, professional judgment decision making. So you can make decisions on what is the best method to use. But then we very rapidly spotted that that was all right for skill acquisition because, of course, you've got lots of undergrads to experiment on, and that's great. But actually, most of what we wanted to do was skill refinement. Mm -hmm. Really, what we wanted to do was to be able to take a guy who'd been practicing javelin for for 12 years and say mate you need to make this change and it fell between two stalls Rob yeah I think unfortunately skill act motor control lecture uh, people have gone this way and sports psych people have gone over here so you had a, a psychology of biomechanical control and a psychology of the frontal lobe emotions but the the thing that was in the gap in the middle yeah was under pressure, how do you control and make sure you're going to execute properly? So one of the strands of that answering that question was to get into skill refinement. And that's how we got into it. Trying to say to coaches, to psychologists, to, you know, to, to the, whole, the full field, that's actually what most of our guys have got to do. That's the essential part of performance. Can I modify my behavior to be able to execute like that consistently and optimally in the heat of battle yeah no i think it's a really interesting problem and it's hard to keep it <laughs> i think you talk about the the black box of uh keeping it yeah. locked once you learn the new one uh, i think it's and there's, she's i used to i used an analogy with one of our olympic coaches i was working with the athlete and i said look through the winter you're designing a pot and you work with your coach, and you say, well, should we put a handle on there? Should we another put a spout on there? Oh, yeah, okay, fine, we got it. Round about March-ish, you need to stop doing that. You need to glaze it and stick it in the oven. 
because otherwise the first time you fill it with beer it'll just go <laughs> so when are you going to stop making the pot and when are you going to fire it and glaze it mm-hmm. and then then you can make another pot next year right <laughs> and that seemed to ch- he went oh yeah that seemed to chime with him and his coach mm-hmm. yeah probably the mention of beer but it worked and all of a sudden now they're going okay so so there's a finite amount of time so that this this spreads quite wide. So, for example, periodization as a physical training parameter has taken a lot of stick, probably justifiably. But periodization as a skill acquisition refinement construct or as a psychological pressure construct is absolutely there. That's, that's a, an area we're moving into. How do you decide how much and when, yeah, change can be done here when you want to perform here. Okay. Because our experience is that to really hammer, to really take apart, tweak, put back together and pressure proof, lock the black box mm-hmm. and hide the key where mm-hmm. they just can't find it, is something like a five to six month job. So if it's a five to six month job, and that's a pretty committed, hard working athlete, If it's a five to six month job, if I want to give someone a new technique for 2020, when am I going to teach it? When am I then going to practice it? And when am I then going to roll it out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea. I I, I think that we don't really think about it that way. You know, the the physical periodization of ramping up and backing off and ramping up. But we don't really think of that in terms of psychological things very often. So. And then, of course, if, mm-hmm. if you work in a sport, like, for example, I have the pleasure of working with New Zealand free skiing and snowboarding. But you're working there. You've got guys who are doing a sport that can kill them. And it's how much pressure can they take in a day? How much can you ask them to go out on a, on a week training camp and go, you're trying your new, I don't know, I, I always call it a WD-40, but you're trying your new Dub-16 or, or Triple Cork, as my father. Yeah? <laughs> and now... You know, that's real pressure. It's going back to the military again. You don't send blokes on missions 12 months of the year because we knew from the First World War they fall apart. Mm-hmm. So why would we do it with athletes? Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so I guess moving on, I, what I wanted to ask is kind of a more couple general questions. First one is like we talked about, you've done a lot of work kind of both on both sides of academia and working directly with athletes. So I want to get your opinion on what have you learned about how we can bridge the gap between research and practice and where do you think we need to go with that? I know that's a big question, but I just want to get your thoughts. It's, yeah, It's one that we ponder a lot. One of my, my colleagues, Lowell Collins, who's no relation, I tell everybody he's my long-lost twin brother, but of course he's far too ugly for that. Lowell talks about pra- the pracademic as perhaps a bridging point, yeah? I think we need people who understand both fields. So everybody in my institute is a coach. Everybody in my institute has coached to a reasonable level. They're qualified. Everybody I, I work with and train as a sports psychologist, I like to go and do coaching. Because they have to understand that, because that's who we work with, yeah? Mm -hmm. So that's who we have to understand. So we have to be able to provide information that's meaningful to them and applicable for them and that addresses the issues they have. But they've got to start looking at this stuff that we do with a slightly more critical eye and look past the simple answer that, for example, the Twitterati and the Paparati and maybe even the Bloggerati, but I'm sorry, <laughs> might out, yeah, and go, actually, that's really interesting. Let me get into the fundamentals of that, yeah? Let me actually go and understand that. Let me go and talk to the bloke who made the answer, mm-hmm. yeah? So I think there is good and bad on both sides. We published an idea of let's use psychology, but it could be any discipline, and the, the progress of psychology through say sport, psychology of sport, and psychology for sport. So in the old days, there were people doing dart throwing experiments and they weren't really interested in dart throwers, they were interested in the psychology of it. And then all of a sudden, sports psychology books started to appear and that was psychology of sport. Most of the things I do are psychology for sport. 
So I'm interested in the sports performance and I'm taking my toolbox of psychology or motor control or physiology or S&C or whatever, and I'm deploying it, but the main thing I'm interested in is performance. Mm -hmm. So you've got to recognize that some people who are on the research side aren't psychology for sport. They're psychology through sport. But the trouble is, I'm not sure sometimes that they recognize that this stuff is over here, but it doesn't necessarily knock over here. So the bottom line is, it's a key debate. I think there's room for maneuver on both sides. I'd like to think that the sort of stuff we put out, very pragmatic, very practical, but grounded, proper evidence base, is useful to coaches. Hope so. Yeah. If not, they won't listen. They won't listen to this interview. <laughs> No, I think uh, you're right on the, the nail there. Yeah, I think you're right. Some people do get confused. I get frustrated with, well, I guess uh, every journal asks you to write this implications, applications paragraph at the end. And some of them are, you're right, doing the, using sport as a way to study the human behavior. And they then they jump to how this very arcane task <laughs> applies to football. Yeah. I hadn't been in the military, I was going to be an astrophysicist. So uh, stuff like particle physics, I love. Mm -hmm. But I'm not necessarily going to read about the work that's been done at CERN and go, so that means that tomorrow I should go out and brush my teeth like this. You know, of course, there is fundamental research. Long may it continue. God bless it. But don't pretend it's applied. And right. don't take applied research and pretend it's fundamental. Yeah, no, I agree. And so the kind of the last kind of general question I had was, you, you mentioned it a little bit a few times today, is the role of social media kind of in research in this endeavor we're doing. and. I think I saw you did a project or an article on blogging uh, a long time ago, and for those um, that, yeah, you, yeah, and for those that don't know, you're a very active on Twitter. You're a must follow. <laughs> like you said, you like to get in arguments. Uh, so, can you talk a little bit about about that? You know, what do you think it's useful, or is there too much noise on it, or, or, or you know, whatever you think about it? You see, I don't like to get into arguments. I like to get in debates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's a, there's a subtle difference. I think it's, I mean, yeah, we, we did a paper where we used blogs as part of the ref, of developing the reflective practice and professional judgment decision making of young coaches. And we recognized that if you did a certain amount of basic, give them the grounding, it then worked very well. But if you just ask them to start discussing why they did what they did and how they do it different, if they didn't know enough, the answers were very stereotypic and, and copied. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like for me, you can't be creative unless you have a certain sort of body of knowledge or appreciation of the, of the thing you're going to be creative in. Yeah. I don't expect my one year old to be a creative artist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but she's like nine or 10 or 11. She can start being creative. Anyway, whatever. That, that's another, that's another, that's another discussion. But, but the main thing here would be that therefore I like the idea of people being able to publish their ideas. I like, however, that people would be critical of those ideas. It, it irritates me when there are people who make a living only consuming others' ideas and putting themselves as the, the middleman, because what happens then is that the guys who are looking to try and get their ideas funded and, and supported, etc., get cut out of the process. So I think, of course, there's a place for social media. I think it's a concern if that's your only source of knowledge. Yeah? Definitely. Um, yeah? <laughs> Definitely. Uh, but unfortunately, I think that might be the case. So it's a, it comes back to the stuff that we started with, mate. It's about triangulation. It's about criticality. It's about going, that sounds interesting. I'll follow that up. Mm -hmm. So my habit would be to read something on social media and go, gosh, that's interesting, and go and get the paper. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah? Or to read something and then go, are you sure? What about diddly diddly dum? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Or maybe, of course, it's been misrepresented because the media have been known for hyperbole and to blow, <laughs> blow things up and to choose very eye-catching headlines. So it's just, whoa, calm down, double-check it would be, you know. But apart from that, the idea that we have other instruments by which we can disseminate results and ideas and, and challenge and debate is fantastic. 
mm-hmm. you know. I guess in the old Greek Greek days, we'd go and sit on the stairs of the temple and have an argument. Yeah. You know, where I'm from in Essex, we'd probably go to the pub and argue. But, you know, it, it's horses for courses. It, it's it's nice to see a source of in, informed debate. Yeah. And I guess following on that, you know, one specific thing that I know you like to debate, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm to talk about this too, is the whatever you want to call it, ecological psychology slash dynamical system slash <laughs> constraints-based approach. Slash, um, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that um, you know, <laughs> the certain segment, you know, is it's very, very popular and can get evangelical <laughs> at times uh, with certain people. You come, are you comfortable with that? Are you comfortable that it is evangelical for some people? I think so. Well, maybe that's too strong of a word, but the, the very nature of it is that it is, it's a total different kind of philosophy. So almost anything I talk about, if you're if you're a really diehard ecologist, so psychologist, you have to try to fit it into that. Yes. <laughs> there's no, no, I guess I'm saying there's no middle ground if you really, really believe that's that. That's my point. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. Several people have suggested epitaphs for me, uh, and some are actually anatomically possible. But um, one that seems to be growing recently is it depends. Okay. So my company, my company is called Grey Matters. Grey Matters because of uh, the rain. Grey Matters because I'm clearly ash blonde. But mostly Grey Matters because it ain't black and white. And so the whole, a lot of our work, and this, this, this idea of coaching as professional judgment and decision making, what should I do in this circumstance? It depends. You know, do you want that or do you want that? So when anybody shows me an idea or a theory or whatever, an approach, then my immediate thought is, okay, what does that mean for practice? Where does it apply? Is there anywhere it doesn't apply? So it strikes me that the idea that if I finish talking to you and walk down the corridor, my brain will have to send signals to my foot every time it hits the floor and wait for a sort of a to and fro. Yeah. Now, I'm not the, I'm not the quickest mover in the world but god's sake that's that's crass that's insane and of course ecological psychology and dynamical systems offers a excellent completely understandable parsimonious explanation for how that works happy face (laughs) but when someone starts going actually that's how a team works that's how a team goes on the pitch and it's just it's nothing to do with their brain. It's nothing to do with the way you prepared them or trained them or briefed them. And in actual fact, I have read, and again, reasons of libel and slander I won't quote, but I've read people who would deny the role of the brain in those sorts of things. They would, as you say, look for an ecological explanation. Now, just because there is an alternative explanation doesn't mean it's a better explanation. And I think as scientists, what we were aiming to do was to come up with the most parsimonious explanation and means of application for these various environments. So my point is, constraints-led coaching, for example. What the heck's that? Does that mean that you don't always have to tell the person what to do? What a brilliant idea. Yeah, I've been coaching like that since I start coaching. You know, I've been reading about that in books before I'd ever heard of ecological and constraints. So, you know, that's it's that's not a new idea. But of course that's right. Of course it's right. But always? No. Or does it mean that if you teach people the principles underpinning the movements they're trying to do and the reasons why they do them in certain ways, explicit coaching, that will make them worse under pressure? No, palpably not, because every single athlete I've ever worked with at high level spends an oodle, oodles of time thinking about what they do. Yeah. So all I'm going is, look, lads, you know, that, that applies over there and it's great. This applies over here. There is clearly therefore going to be a shades of grey in the middle. I, if I read another paper that offers me an alternative explanation of something that's already been well explained from a, another viewpoint, I'm going, what the... You know, again, if I may, I, I, I refer to it as academic masturbation. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's having a good time, but it's not doing much for me. Mm-hmm. So really, 
I, I, I'll stop ranting in a minute, I promise. No problem. So, <laughs> you, it's just, it's looking at a situation where you go, this applies really well here. This is brilliant. Understand this. This is great. But it doesn't necessarily offer us the best explanation over here. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Mm-hmm. That seems to me a sensible position. Yeah. There's a lot of value in there. and But yeah, I think it goes a bit too far sometimes. I just think yeah. people go, and, and mate, yeah. it's the same the other way. Yeah, definitely. It's really the same the other way. You know, so people would trash schema theory. Mm-hmm. And you'd go, well, I don't know. It's a lot of good, good ideas in there. That Schmidt bloke is pretty bright. You know, there's a lot going on in there. But clearly, it doesn't operate in the very mechanistic way that he thought it did. Yeah. And so I guess the very last question I want to ask, maybe, can you talk a little bit about your, some of the work you're doing now and coming up in the future? What's new and exciting? It's, it's a pretty eclectic mix. Uh, I mean, I can see the join. I'm lucky I don't have to necessarily explain it to my dean. <laughs> uh, yeah. but, but pretty much, if you were to take... If you, if you said, look, there's a principle of pragmatism. We want to make a difference. There's a principle of PJDM. It dependsness. Yeah. And, and marginaling out where it does. And there's a principle of performance. Yeah. And, and you take those and away we go. So what do we got at the minute? We're doing stuff in mental health, but in terms of whether the diagnostic tools used for Mr. Average are applicable or give false positives or false information when you use a elite athlete. So we're very interested in the nature of the mental health of the elite performer. And when I say athlete, I should actually say performer because we're doing it in music and hopefully dance as well. There's a lot of stuff in professional judgment and decision making. So do coaches make intuitive decisions? Yes-ish in that it's not something that just floats into their head from the perfidious ether or, you know, using the force. It's it's something that's been put in there and they've structured their thinking and therefore they'll come up with answers. But they can generally post hoc explain why that was a good answer. So some of our stuff on intuition looks at people who make intuitive decisions, but generally they will then run that through in their head afterwards and go, Ooh, what's the logic underpinning that? Was that the best decision I could have made? And and that's particularly because we do a lot of that in adventure sports, where the consequences of making a bad decision are someone gets killed, and it looks bad in your CV. So you, you sort of tend to. <laughs> and then probably the final area that we're sort of we're starting to work in is to continue this talent development thread. We've got longitudinal studies. We've probably got five six years of data now of people coming through talent development environments, coming through talent development systems. We've been developing tools to help evaluate the system, evaluate the athlete, guide the way in which the athlete might well be developed. But we're we're now looking at the management of that pathway, the information that a governing body might issue to parents and coaches to prepare people for that pathway. But then we want to clearly need to back up some of the ideas we've had in the super champs and the T- PCDEs with longitudinal data. And that's that's what we're doing. Keeps us out of trouble, Rob. Keeps yeah, it sounds like it. Keep you a little bit busy. <laughs> well, that was great, Dave. I really thank you for taking some time to talk with me today. Absolute pleasure. And uh, thank you for your time. Hope, uh, hope people enjoyed it. Cheers. Thanks again for the great discussion, Dave. I look forward to seeing you debate more on Twitter and reading the great research that is coming from your group at UCLan. You can find out more about Dave from the links in the show notes. Coming soon on the Perception and Action podcast, a look at recovery from a psychological point of view. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now.